So here we told that we have hot industrial wastewater at 15 bar and 180 degrees C. That's coming in here with a mass flow rate of 5 kilograms per second. And it enters what's called a flash chamber. That's this container or chamber here. And what happens is that that water comes in and it, um, it very rapidly uh, becomes a saturated liquid and a saturated vapor up here. So, so this is saturated vapor up here and this is saturated liquid and um, we're told that the saturated liquid is at four bars and the saturated vapor is also at four, four bars. The saturated, saturated liquid gets drained off at the bottom, the saturated vapor continues on, probably should put an arrow in here, continues on into a turbine. So this is a turbine and that turbine is used to generate some power. So I'll just write a W dot by here that's going out that we're extracting from the saturated vapor and then it leaves the turbine at 0 .08, 0 0.08 bar in a quality of 90 percent. We're told the uh, stray heat transfer and kinetic and potential energy effects are negligible for operation at steady state determine the power developed by the turbine. So we want to find out what this power is. So we have a, a few components occurring here. There's some sort of valve and flash chamber and a turbine. We're trying to find the power coming out of the turbine, so that makes me think that we'll want to apply the first law to the turbine. So I'm going to draw a control volume around that turbine, and then I'm going to apply the first law to it. So let me write out the first law. I'll write it out in its entirety here, and then we'll simplify. This is the way that you should always do it is just start with the entire first law, write the whole thing out, and then simplify it. Don't try to simplify it first because then you, it's, it's harder to follow your work. So somebody else trying to follow what you did would get confused if you didn't start with the basics and then simplify. Okay, so that's the first law. And to make things convenient, I'm going to put some numbers on here. I'm going to say that uh, state 1 is right here. We're given some information about what's happening here. I'm going to call this one down here state 2, where the saturated liquid is. State 3 will be this line that goes from the outlet of this flash chamber, and it's also state 3 at the inlet to the turbine. Right? So this, this whole line here is at state 3. And then finally, this will be state 4 down there. So I'm going to apply the first law specifically to the turbine, so I'm going to be dealing with states 3 and 4. So first of all, we're told that um, everything's operating at steady state, so that this term will be 0 because it's steady state. We're told that we can neglect stray heat transfer and kinetic and potential energy effects. So that's going to be 0 there, and these two terms will be 0 as well. Those are all because they're we're told. Uh, they're givens. Uh, the next thing to do is to find the mass flow rate at the inlet and outlet. So if I apply conservation of mass, I'll just do it this one time here for that same control volume. Since it's steady state, that term is zero, and then we'll have just one mass flow rate coming in, and that's m.3, and then m.4 is a mass flow rate going out, so you quickly see that m.3 is equal to m.4. So it's just a single ma mass flow rate. We'll just call it m dot. And by the way, that's, uh, well, we'll come back to the mass flow rates a little bit later. So we'll just call it m dot for right now. So if I then simplify my first law expression, I'm going to get the power generated by the turbine will be the mass flow rate times h in, which would be h3 minus h out, which would be h4. All right, so Let's see if we can evaluate this. We're told at state 4 what the pressure and quality is. Since I know that there's a quality, that I know that that means we're in a saturated liquid vapor mixture phase. right? So what I'll do to find that specific enthalpy is I'll go to the saturated liquid vapor mixture table for water at that given pressure, and then um, just calculate what the specific enthalpy is. And it's, if specifically, I have to make sure I take into account the quality. So let me write that down. H4 would be 1 minus the quality at 4 times the specific enthalpy of the saturated liquid 
at state 4, plus the quality at 4 times the specific enthalpy of the saturated vapor at 4. And the quality, 0 0.90. And if you go to the saturated liquid vapor mixture table, for that given pressure of 0 0.08 bar, and look up the value, I'm not going to show the, you know, looking it up here, but uh, hopefully you can do that. You've done enough problems, you can look up property properties from property tables. But that's the saturated liquid specific enthalpy at that pressure, and the saturated vapor specific enthalpy at that pressure is 2576.2 kilojoules per kilogram. Again, these come from saturated liquid vapor mixture table at P equals 0 0.08 bar. Okay, so if you plug in the numbers here, you'll get H4 comes out to be 23 36 kilojoules per kilogram. Okay, so now we need to find H3. So here we're told we're dealing with saturated vapor at 4 bar. Okay, so that one should be straightforward. What we'll do is we'll go to the saturated liquid vapor mixture table at 4 bar and look up the saturated vapor specific enthalpy. So H3, if we do that, H3 will just be 27 38.1 kilojoules per kilogram. Again, that comes from the saturated liquid vapor mixture table. H3 is equal to H vapor 3 at P3 is equal to 4 bar. Okay, so then we can, we now have the specific enthalpies. What we're missing though is that mass flow rate. We don't have that mass flow rate value. So in order to find the mass flow rate, um, you know, I, I look through this whole system. The place where we have the mass flow rate is right here at this inlet. But the mass flow rate, um, so we know what the mass flow rate at 1 is, but it breaks into two streams, you know, stream 3 and stream 2. So I don't know what the mass flow rate going into 3 is. So I'm going to have to try to figure that out. So let me go ahead and pick another control volume. Let me choose this control volume. It surrounds that. And let me apply conservation of mass to that control volume. So conservation of mass will look like this. And again, we know that we're at steady state, so that first term is zero. The mass flow rate in here would be m.1 and out it would be m.2 plus m.3. So this will tell me that m.1 is equal to m.2 plus m.3. What we need up here is like m.3. That's that's the mass flow rate going into here. Right? m.3 and m.4 are the same. So I'm, I'm really looking for m.3. So that's not enough information. It helps, but it's not enough because all I know here is m.1. That m.1 is the five kilograms per second. So I need something else that involves mass flow rate. So the other thing I can do is apply the first law to that control volume. And the reason I'm thinking about that is that involves mass flow rates. Plus I'm, I'm getting changes in um, the states, you know, between one, two, and three. So, you know, that might involve the first law because we deal with various states in the first law. So let's apply the first law there. We'll write it all out. Okay, so there we go. And uh, again, since we're dealing with steady state, this first term will be zero. We were told to neglect heat transfer, so that term will be zero. We're also told to neglect kinetic and potential energy changes. So these terms will be zero. And then uh, if you go back up, well, my, there we go. If you go back up here and look, there's no work being done in that control volume. There's no shaft work, electrical work, spring work, nothing like that. So the work term will be zero as well. 
And then at the inlet, we have just one inlet. That's the conditions at one. And But the, for the outlet here, we have two outlets at two and three. So let me write all that out. So we're going to have zero is equal to m dot one times h1 minus m dot two times h2 minus m dot three times h3. So you can see we now have another expression involving mass flow rate at two and mass flow rate at three. So these two together will be helpful. All right, so now let's go ahead and um, do a little bit of rearranging to solve for m dot three. Okay, so let me um, let me substitute in for let, let me rearrange this to solve for m dot two. It'll be m dot one minus m dot three, and I'm going to substitute that in right here. So I'll have zero is equal to m dot one h one minus m dot one minus m dot three times h two minus m dot three times h three, and I'm just going to solve that for m dot three because m dot three is what I need to calculate my power here, right? M dot one is known. So if I do a little more algebra on this, I'm going to get M dot three is equal to M dot one, and it'll be H one minus H two divided by H three minus H two. So that's what you'll get when you do the algebra to solve for M dot three here. Okay, so now we know m dot one, that's the five kilograms per second. H3 we know because we found that from the saturated vapor conditions. So we need to find H1 and H2. So let's go back up here and see what we're working with. So H2 should be pretty straightforward. We're dealing with a saturated liquid at four bars. So H2 we can find knowing that H2 is the value of the saturated liquid at uh, four bars. So we can look that up in a saturated liquid vapor mixture table and uh, that comes out to be 604.65 kilojoules per kilogram. So that's from saturated liquid vapor mixture table at P equals four bars. So that one's pretty straightforward. Now for state one, we have uh, 15 bar and 100, 180 degrees C. So I'm going to look again at the saturated liquid vapor mixture table organized based on, let's say, uh, pressure, and then see uh, what kind of phase we're in. So again, from saturated liquid vapor mixture table, at P equals 15 bar, what we would find is that the corresponding saturation temperature is, what, let's see, um, I'm not sure if I ha I've written it down, but what you'll find is, well, unfortunately I, I, I haven't written that down, but what you'll find is that the temperature at one is less than the saturation temperature at that particular pressure. Right, so our temperature that we're given is uh, 180 degrees C is less than the saturation temperature, which unfortunately I didn't write down, but uh, you can go ahead and look at it on your own in the table. So that means that we're dealing with a compressed liquid phase. That the temperature is less than the temperature that would be required to start turning some of that water into vapor. So we're in a compressed liquid phase. So to find the to find the specific enthalpy at one, it's going to be the specific enthalpy of the compressed liquid at T1, P1. And we know from our compressed liquid approximations that'll be the specific enthalpy of the saturated liquid at T1 plus the pressure at one minus the saturation pressure at T1, all times the specific volume of the saturated liquid at T1. Okay, so that's our compressed liquid approximation. So if you look up these values, that one, again, this, these all come from the saturated liquid vapor mixture tables. 
at T1, this will be 763.05. Kilojoules per kilogram. P1 is our 15 bar. Saturation pressure is at, at T1 is 10.028 bar. And the specific volume at that temperature is 0 0.0011274 cubic meters per kilogram. So you have to be a little careful to, of the unit conversion. Remember the pressures in bars, this is cubic meters per kilogram, so you're going to have to do a little unit conversion to make sure it's all consistent with kilojoules per kilogram. It's easy to make a mistake there. But when you work it all out, H1 comes out to be 763.1 kilojoules per kilogram. So now we have enough information to calculate what M.3 is. If you do that, we'll get M.3 is 0.371 kilograms per second. And now that we have M.3, we can go back up and calculate the power coming out of the turbine. And when you do that, it comes out to be 149 kilowatts. All right, so just to kind of recap this problem, we have a system of several components kind of linked together. And what we did is we, we wanted to find the power coming out of the turbine, so we applied the first law to the turbine. We found the properties coming in and out just using the uh, saturated liquid vapor mixture tables. And then uh, what we were missing was the mass flow rate coming into three. From conservation of mass, the mass flow rate into three is equal to mass flow rate coming out at four. But we don't know that mass flow rate. So to find that, we set up another control volume, one that enclosed the flash tank and this valve, because we know the properties at one, two, and three. So we did a conservation of mass to that control volume to show that the mass flow rate at one is equal to the mass flow rate at two plus the mass flow rate at three. And then we applied the first law, and that gave us another expression involving mass flow rate and the uh, properties at one, two, and three. So we combined the first law, I'm sorry, we combined conservation of mass and the first law together to get an expression for the mass flow rate at three, but we still needed to get some properties at, at two and three for the specific enthalpy. So at two, it was a saturated liquid, so that was easy to look up in the saturated liquid vapor mixture tables. At one, what we found was the for the given pressure, the temperature is less than the saturation temperature at that 15 bar, meaning that we're in a compressed liquid phase. So we found the specific enthalpy there using the compressed liquid approximation. And then once we had that, we could find the mass flow rate at three using our equation here. And then once we had that, we could actually go back and calculate the power coming out of the turbine since we now had M.3. All right, we'll end the example there.